Okay, welcome back. Uh, this morning we're going to be talking with one of our senior supervisors, uh, David Levenstein. Uh, and uh, first, uh, we'll let David introduce himself to those of you who don't recognize him. And well, as Alan said, I've been a supervisor here at the Family Institute for the last uh, 10 odd years. Um, Besides that, I'm a clinical social worker and I've worked in many different uh, aspects of that profession. I think that's about what I'd like I, to say. And you're an accredited family therapist and oh, right, I'm accredited family therapist and uh, the accredited family supervisor. Therapist. Yes. It's very important. Therapy, okay. Family therapy. Right. And uh, so today, what uh, David and I thought we would do would be to have a discussion about uh, the current corona situation in families where, that have uh, adult children. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, um, uh, we're talking about what it's like to be an adult child of uh, parents who are dealing with it, what it's like to be a parent of an adult child who is dealing with it, how it affects relationships for the better, more of a challenge, more of a burden. So um, David uh, is going to think out loud with us and <laughs> just pay attention to the fact that David Thanks. So you'll hear him thinking before you'll hear him talking. <laughs> right. Um, actually, when I when Al asked me to think about this, I I first actually thought about my own family. I'm a, we have a three generations here in Israel. Um, we have my, my wife and I are here, and we have three sons, and two of them are married, and they have uh, and they have uh, children of their own. And I sort of thought about how. This has affected, first of all, our relationships, and how, uh, first of all, the, um, I think the most salient factor of that is that we can't be with them right. during, uh, during this, uh, this crisis. Uh, we can see them, we can talk to them, we can uh, you know, do what we can with these uh, technological you know, innovations that we have these days, but we can't, we can't, uh, yeah, actually, uh, my daughter-in-law did come by when she could still drive. That was a few, few days ago before we had more restrictions. And uh, we, we were inside and she went into the garden and we talked a bit. And so it was actually very nice. But, but I think that's the, um, the biggest thing that I thought of, sort of immediately was that uh, one is this uh, tremendous cutoff that we have from our, uh, from our families. Right. So let's think out loud about, uh, first of all, about that lack of physical connection and perhaps much less continuous connection or mm -hmm. prolonged connection, you know, like a long visit for a weekend or whatever. And uh, try to think what the impact is on the relationship. What about it um, burdens the relationship, how it uh, how it how it uh, changes the form of the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, I, I think I would actually add one more thing mm -hmm. before we get uh, answer your question, and that is that uh, I find that more uh, like people in my children's generation have had to make they've had to make that decision. Not to, um, not to be in contact with their parents or not to let their children be in contact with their parents. This was even before the government came in and said, yeah, you really, really can't do it. And people really had to sort of wrestle with that, the dilemma, what, what are we going to do here? Are we really going to, mm -hmm. are we going to cut off? Are we going to... Uh, uh, I think especially when... when uh, uh, this whole new situation, it took different people, different, different amount of time to really absorb what was happening. Right. And, uh, and so they can end up people who it took them a bit longer to decide and they have to deal with the, with the question, did they do something wrong with the fact that they, they kept seeing their parents or they kept uh, bringing, you know, bring the, right. uh, the children, the, the grandchildren, the grandparents together. Right. But as, as far as your question, I think um, it, it's, it's, it's a very kind of interesting question because I think one, one of the things that is happening uh, all over with the, uh, with the corona um, 
crisis is that people are looking for connection all the time. Like I, I know I've been talking to people that I never talked to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that happens in, that can happen in families as well, that people are looking how to compensate for the lack of uh, regular connection. And people I think end up often talking more to each other than they've been talking before. Right. Just from a distance. Right. So um, there's some qualitative and some quantitative uh, issues. But let's let's think together about what you mentioned about um, making decisions. Because yeah, one yeah. of the difficulties, at least here in Israel, is that uh, you have to kind of think what you're going to be told tomorrow. Because mm -hmm. there's this rolling way of communicating, which uh, there's been some criticism of, but that's how it is. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, under those circumstances, um, people... Let's say adult children. Okay, you. Uh, yeah, I lost you here. Oh, you, you have you back. You lost hearing me, David. Okay, we're gonna pause the recording for a minute. Okay, we're back. Um, yeah. The internet is back for as long as it lasts. And um, this is a live example of interrupted communication in the right. time of Corona. The internet is flooded. So, um, you know, you started to mention about making decisions. Right. So here you have adult children who are challenged. And then the question comes up, who's, who, who do they communicate with about the decision? You know, is mm -hmm. this a communication that they figure out? Do they talk with you about it? Is, is it something that's worked out uh, in a way that, for those of us who are dealing with uh, learning about family systems, that's regulatory, everybody thinks for everybody else, or is it intersubjective that people ask, what would it be like for you if we do this? Uh, what do you think? Well, I, I think it's it probably it really, uh, I was say uh, when you were talking, I was reminded of my neighbor, who um, we had just a short little talk about this, you know, with uh, two meters distance between us, Right. And she was complaining about the fact that her children were were insisting that they not they not come over there or or her children or her or other people in her family and she was i am sure she was accepting it, but she was not happy about it she was not right. happy about it and I can imagine that then in some families this can cause a kind of conflict because the question, who's really making this decision? Right, right. See, if we think about differentiation, there's an opportunity um, when you leave the regular, um, the regular, you know, families have a, a, a flow, right? That you kind of get into a, a situation where this is when you see it and what you don't, and it's, uh, it's, it works out, and let's say it works out reasonably well, uh, but then, oh, uh, it doesn't work anymore. And right. so you have to renegotiate something. And renegotiating something like, I mean, you know, it's not a divorce, but it's a visitation issue. So, uh, <laughs> um, so renegotiating visitation is, is a real challenge. You could see that some families might find it an opportunity, I don't think most families, to raise the level of differentiation, to talk about the meaningfulness of, of uh, connection and who needs to see what and how it works. And uh, um, and talk about it intersubjectively. What it'll be like for me. What it'll be like for you. Things that usually you don't need to talk about. Just do it and go along. But I think for most families, the likelihood is there's going to be some sort of a fetch. In other words, something that one side isn't sure how the other side is thinking. Don't know what the government is thinking. And so, uh, like your neighbor, um, we won't disclose your address. So no one will know who your neighbor is. Um, uh, unless the, the, the Shabak knows your address, <laughs> then what can we do? Um, the uh, um, uh, people take it personally. In other words, there's a question am I protecting myself? Am I protecting you? How sure am I? Why do I decide now before the government has said, you know, what, you want to give some thought to that? Um, uh... Look, I think that uh, uh, you mentioned the government. Well, everyone had to sort of 
decide how much they were going to decide this for themselves and how much right. they were going to just do what they were told. Right. And that are, uh, and they're, they're, and, and here, I mean, this isn't so much our topic, but I think that uh, this was a very, this is a big challenge in the, in the Haredi community. Right. The, uh, but I think we won't talk about that so much now. Um, well, well, we'll get back to it. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. But I think really each person is making, uh, is, has, is really sort of making a decision for themselves how much to think this through for themselves and how much to just sort of go along with what's right. going on around them. And then when you have the family, so then everybody is, 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 is in that situation of how much am I going to decide this for myself and how am I going to, so how much am I going to decide this because of what the government says, how much am I going to decide this because that's what we're doing in our family. I mean, these are all different uh, sort of angles that, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can just say personally that uh, uh, when these first guidelines came out, I didn't know what to do with them. And so I sort of I sort of took a day off and said, well, I'm not doing anything today until I figure out a little bit more what I'm doing. And then I asked everybody that I knew what they were doing. Really? And in the end, I didn't do what every, most everybody was doing, but it certainly helped to kind of sort of get my balance in order. And I think everybody on some level is going through that process of deciding how do you, how do you come to your own decision about what to, what to do. Right. So, so this, this is sort of, in some ways, uh, puts an interesting focus on the question of adult children. In other words, the discussion of adults, between adults. There are older adults and younger adults. There are, but the, an adult is somebody who takes responsibility for his own decisions. And uh, here we have people being challenged to make decisions about relationships with other adults. Mm -hmm. You know, in the case of your children, older adults, more experienced adults, mm -hmm. but actually nobody knows what the hell is going on. In other words, right. and everybody knows that nobody knows what the hell is going on. So as a result, uh, you end up with a situation where everybody has to choose, and the choices are not purely objective. Nobody has the facts. Everybody knows that nobody has the facts. And so... Well, I, 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 think that not, I think it's... I wouldn't agree that everybody knows that nobody has the facts. Some people think they have the facts. I think, certainly, I have met many people along the way who think they have the facts. And, and they probably need to think that. Yeah, and, and also there are people who are more uh, willing to believe that the government right. is the facts. Right. Um, uh, and um, um, I mean, the, the only thing that, that was clear to me about this was that whatever the government would decide, there would be plenty of people who would know better. That, that, that was for sure. Right. They would, they would, uh, um, um, but I think I lost the, the uh, direction here where. Um, no, so, so, so here we have every adult lives in a complicated world and takes responsibility for it, right? But every adult um, has a different relationship to facts, mm -hmm. to what is what is it that you know what that you don't know and some people would prefer to be sure that they know and other people would be sure that they don't know but they still have to decide it's easier if you're sure that you know but yes. one, one adult thinks he knows another adult says what are you talking about if i don't know it so how do you know it <laughs> yeah. so that's a that's a conversation between us sometimes it's a, an argument between adults right mm -hmm. or politics it's a uh, frontal war between adults. But uh, between, you know, regular citizens, there's still this nuance about, you know, any, there's a difference. No adult is the same. You know, here we're dealing with something that's so cloudy that each person pulls together what makes sense for him. And that's his world. It's a little different than the other guy's world. And so you have these adults with different worlds. And then the question is- yeah, so and, the here you, and, and then here come up with a question in different families what is the attitude in the family toward that situation? Right. It's like, in this family, does everybody have to 
come up with the same with the same conclusion or in, and who are they following and uh, in, uh, and who, who like who needs to worry about who within the within the, uh, within the system right so this is sort of an intimate conversation you know like when you think about a loss a loss is a very intimate issue because uh, all of you was involved in some way in breaking a puzzle apart and putting it together but here reality becomes a very intimate issue because all of you has to figure out how you relate to reality you're a leader you're a follower you're a follower of who uh, how do you relate to uh, relationships as opposed to safety now you know the truth is that when your grandchildren have a flu your your kids as adults have to think about whether to bring them or not to bring them, right? Right. right? And if they have a cold, it's a little muddier. And if it's mm -hmm. corona that they don't have, but they might have, it's even muddier. And the fact right. that the corona is not going to hurt them, but could kill you, according to them. <laughs> so right. that makes it. So it's right. a very intimate kind of conversation. And, and I think in general, um, what's really unique about this situation at least to a certain extent, and it, it, it could be that it's not so true because like certainly the, uh, the first information that we seem to be getting was that the only people who were in danger were older adults. Now it seems that that's not quite the, uh, quite as um, sort of cut and dry as it seemed at the beginning, but it meant that all the other, the younger generations are all changing their behavior in a drastic way for the older generation. Right. Now, you know, families are families. There might mm -hmm. be some families where visits are challenging. Right. And then um, Corona shows up. <laughs> you know, you can say to yourself, give me a break. This isn't about Corona. This is about the fact <laughs> that you don't like coming. Right. right. <laughs> there might be some families like that. There mm -hmm. might be many families like that, you know, that, the, that, you know, you can say some families would say, let's say the grandparent says, oh, you're not coming. Well, that's really a problem. And the adult child says, it's not a problem for you. It's a break. And we know it's a break. You, you look at what you look like at the end of every visit. So you have a couple of weeks off. So mm -hmm. there's a question about uh, the honesty of the communication. Um, and, you know, this in some ways brings us to a question of triangles. Uh, which corona is a triangle any mm -hmm. crisis can create a kind of a triangle of communication <clears throat> so the adult child says to the <clears throat> adult the, the the parent this isn't about you and me it's about corona right. <laughs> and the parent says to the adult child this isn't about you and me it's about corona and so there's no communication about you and me yes. and how we negotiate corona which would mean that differentiation would tend to decrease mm -hmm. yeah yeah Oh, but you could also have the, the situation where one side is saying it's about Corona, and the other side is saying it's not about Corona at all. You've been waiting for this opportunity to distance yourself for, right. for years. So don't, you know, don't pull that one over on me. Right. And then where would that go? I mean, if you were uh, a therapist and you heard that, what would you, where would you try to take that? Um, where would I would try to take that? Well, I think uh, I would try to do two things. I would, uh, I would, and I don't know which one I would do first, but okay. I would do, uh, one of them would be to talk about the reality and try to, uh, in that sense, in tr try to establish Corona as a kind of neutral subject. It has a, a reality all of its own, and it's not just a reflection of the, the um, dynamic within the family. But I would also probably have to um, sort of investigate, well, what's, what is coming up here that is being a, sort of a, a, what's the word I'm looking for, it's sort of activated by this, uh, this external situation. Right. 
And then we have the question about whether this is a time when people can talk or that they're less able to talk because they're, they're emotionally activated as well. In mm -hmm. other words, here it's not like, you know, the luxury of talking about Corona a year later and saying, you know, and what did you feel? We'll probably be having one hell of a lot of family sessions about Corona a year later. Afterwards. Afterwards. Yeah. But no, I, I think you're right. Right. I mean, certainly, certainly what I've, uh, what I found is that, um, one, that uh, my clients in general are missing the therapy room. Uh-huh. And they, they speak, they, it's less about even talking through the medium and like not being in the same room, but it's not, but it's which room we're in. Uh -huh. And uh, I think even the, and the most sort of conflictual couples, I would say, are saying, we can't do this. Like you can, we can't talk about things and here in this non-neutral place. Um, and what's, what's going to happen when we close the screen? We're just going to be home. We're not going to even have any kind of transition between being in therapy and being home. So we can't, we can't do that. Uh -huh. Whereas, uh, or, or even, or if I would say about like individual cl clients, well, someone will say, well, how can I, how can I talk in my room about someone else in my family when they're on the other side of the wall? I just can't do that. So I can't. Right. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a real question. How much can we really contain in this kind of situation? Right. Whereas uh, afterwards, as you say, I, I think there'll be a lot to talk about. Right. Like people can finally come out of their homes and go to their therapists and go to the, that other place and start and start uh, sort of unloading what uh, what they need right. to what need to work on. So in some ways, um, and then we'll we'll try to apply this to the communications with adult children. <clears throat> in some ways, people are um, putting things off, and part of the question is, do they know they're putting them off? In mm -hmm. other words, um, there are things that when people are in treatment, they have that extra place to contemplate or mentalize about things. And then they have the time, if it's a couple together, or if it's an individual baby, on the way back from therapy, a hell of a lot happens on the mm -hmm. way to and from therapy. And then there's no to and from therapy. There's just the room itself, which uh, you sort of suddenly, you know, fall into something. For the therapist, it isn't so hard. But for the client, it's a strange experience. And it's right. a strange experience that it's even if nobody can hear anything in the other room, it's a strange experience. Mm -hmm. So um, people who are already in therapy, uh, I think a lot of them are going to be using therapy differently. They're going to be yes, thinking yes. about what they're not thinking about, or at least thinking about what they're not talking about, because it's not time to talk about it, because everybody's on the edge. And uh, as a result, you're sort of uh, mentalizing about a package of regulation, but how you can keep things alive uh, or sort of half alive or sort of on, on the, the back burner and not look into them until people are uh, back to uh, back to the usual situation. Like well, when you were talking, I was thinking again, uh, how it seems to me that for, for many people, this, this is a kind of it's like a break from regular life. Right now, right. Right now, and I find that that means that for some people, that's kind of, it's a kind of relief. Uh -huh. That they can put problems aside because there's absolutely nothing we can do about it now. Uh -huh. Right, and those could also be uh, relationship problems. That we're putting aside right. because yeah, if you're not sure. facing the case, you can't solve it. I think, I think, and I think the kind of things you, we were talking about before about what's coming up between, let's say, the different generations or the the uh, the, uh, the different adults within the family, that can also be something that people are saying, this is not the time to talk about it. Now's the time we have to just uh, sort of 
close ranks and get through whatever we need to get through. Right. And those closing ranks, you know, you would like to think, hope that um, it's a conscious decision and not something you sort of schlepped into and then stuck with. And that would depend partly on the way that we communicate as therapists to people about what is a good time to do things about what might not be the right time. So, you know, in therapy in general, especially in family therapy, we always think about timing. You know, we're mm-hmm. always thinking about, wait a second, before you think, you know, what else? Is, look at the extended family. Is there somebody about to drop dead? Is there somebody, you know, just getting married? Is this the time to bring this up? And uh, um, right now, with people um, worried about us, the old folks, dropping dead any moment. <laughs> so there may be things that this is not the time to talk about because it's just too uh, worrisome. But, but I wanted to bring up another topic that has to do with adult to adult, which is that in some ways, um, people our age think we know better. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about that. What do you think? Yeah, but I think this is one of the times, well, when you finish your, what you wanted to say, and then I'll, then I'll react to it. Okay, well, you know, I was going to say that, you know, us folks, we think we have more life experience, mm-hmm. but and none of us went through the Spanish flu, our parents or grandparents right. went through this. Our grandparents went through the Flemish. Spanish. My, my father was old. Like, he think, was like a grandfather, but he went through yeah, it. I think, I think my, my parents were just born around the time of the Spanish. Right. But I'm talking about myself. My father was born in 1899, so he, uh-huh. okay. he was already in medical school during the Spanish flu. Yeah. Uh, although I never spoke with him about it, because who cares? You know, it's just like ancient history. Um, so we're not really wiser about that. And in some ways, because of our media limitations, all of us, one way or the other, we got to accept it. Our kids actually know better to understand communications. But on the other hand, they haven't raised the whole generation and they're new to this game. And so there's a sort of a friction about who's wise here. Yeah. Um... Uh, I, I would I would just add one more thing, which uh, is that I think that for the generation underneath us, it's much more likely that this kind of crisis is cutting something off for them. Go on. In the sense that in their careers in their studying, in their, uh, you there? Yeah, yeah. I think we've I, I, uh, I lost you again. Um, internet problems? Gonna pause for a moment till we get back. You were starting to say about interruptions, so you got interrupted, you shouldn't have used that word because you know the Shabak knows that you're talking about interruptions. Mm-hmm. So um, um, what you were starting to say is that the adults who are our children are experiencing less, much less certain world than right, they right. had. Like, um, I think if, like, like people like your, your mind age, like most people our age are retired already. So it's... Um, we have it, much to lose, you know. Right, we have, this, right, in that sense, we have less to lose. Bituachlumi is going to pay us or not, <laughs> but aside from that... Like we're more or less, we're sort of set. Is that is a, 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 a and a, I think for people who are like thirty years younger, they are in the midst of, sort of realizing themselves in life. Right. Whether it's their family, their career, their plans to travel, whatever it is, and uh, and so I think that. And that's just just the difference between the generations. How this is being, this is being experienced. What you know, what the meaning of all this is. Right. And uh, uh, so for people, people our age. So we'll, you know, so we'll wait around until it's finished. But they, you know, that's it's it's harder for younger people just to wait around. Right. Well, you were in Israel already in seventy three. Yes. Because I think that probably was uh, the closest uh, for the Israeli experience of people that are still alive yeah. um, 
to, to this sort of uncertainty, the sense of, you know, things are stopped. But it seems that that was different than this crisis. Yeah, I think it was, it was very different. Actually, um, there's another crisis I'll get back to, which I think actually uh -huh. reminded me more of this. Um, no, in Iran, in the, in 73, after, you know, during, when the war was over, uh, many people were in the army for months afterwards. I mean, I was, I had not, I wasn't a citizen yet at the time, so I hadn't been in the army, but uh, like everybody I worked with was away for months. Right. And things just sort of, they did. They didn't stop in the same way they stop now. But uh, it certainly was, it was very similar in the sense that it came out of nowhere. Right. Unexpected. It was completely unexpected. Right. Uh, Israel was in a kind of like post-67 euphoria for a year, you know, those years. And then right. it was like the... Uh, the bottom came, you know, dropped out. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, the the the, um, the crisis that I was more uh, reminded of mm -hmm. was the uh, second second Intifada, which was like in the nineties. And the reason I, I remember that was that uh, when it first started, I remember I started reading uh, like in the newspapers, and they were saying, and this is when. Where the buses started exploding and really and right. something like we'd never experienced before and, and not certainly not in that to that extent and they said well this is going to go on for a few years and i said to myself that's impossible this cannot go on for a few years there's no way that you can live like this for a few years right. well we all did right and I think we have the same kind, I was having the same kind of sense now when they said, well, this can go on for another year and a half until we finish this. And I said, my first reaction was, you can't live like this for a year and a half. Well, who knows, maybe we all have to live like this for, for really it's an extended amount of time. Right. But one of the things that I think uh, is, is profoundly different about the 73 war and the uh, the second Intifada started on Rosh Hashanah 2000. Um, I remember because I was right, right after Rosh Hashanah, I was driving and I couldn't drive the usual way because the roads were blocked. Um, the, um, is that the social distancing of the corona makes for the solidarity, uh, it's a different feeling of solidarity. In other words, I think Israelis, uh, the Israeli experience of solidarity is very clear when you're under attack. And uh, 73 and the Intifada was something that there was a lot of political discussion, but nonetheless, the people felt the solidarity that we had to pull from this together. And the fact that you could, you know, be close with the people that you were dealing with uh, made a huge difference. And uh, this business of social distancing, I think, makes the usual kind of feeling of solidarity uh, a bit uh, uh, hard to grasp, literally. Yeah, but it's, it's, solidarity is only over, it's only over the media. Right. Like I, one of the things that I've been thinking about is that I've basically been home for two weeks. And like the first, the first uh, days I would go out more, it was more like, a, you know, we went to these, like to parks and to, you know, did to Lim and things. But really since at least the last week or so, I've just more or less been at home. And I have like no sense of what is really happening outside. The only sense I have is what I see on the screen. Right, right. And, um, and so what, with, what we're sort of talking about <clears throat> is that there's a new experience. In other words, that the adults who are our children. Going back to what you said before. Yes, it's like something we don't, we don't, it's not as if we can tell our children, well, we've been through this before and we sort of know what to, what what to expect. Like we, right. you know, in that sense, it's 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 more akin to all the people who came on the different aliot, or say some of the aliot, where the um, where the older generation had a much harder time understanding what was really going on than the uh, than the younger generation. Right. Right. So to that extent. Um, you sort of have to take the puzzle apart. In other words, there isn't the right decision. If we go back to this question of 
how you make decisions. There isn't a right decision, but there is the possibility of a decision that's understandable from both sides. Um, you know, because families, after all, you know, your kid makes a decision about what gun to send your grandchild to. I need to think that that's a terrible decision, right? For whatever reason, you may be right, you may be wrong, but you have a different idea, you know, a different set of anxieties, or, you know, there's differences. But uh, there, you know, it's easier for us to say, look, you know, um, we're not current in the Ghanim. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, they have to make the decisions and they have to learn from experience. And there's room to learn from experience and there's room to talk about it. And there may be room to say reservations aside, but you're an adult. That's this issue of the adult child. You're an adult, so you'll figure out, you know, what's best. And there's two of you, so hopefully, so you figure out for the two of you. Um, but uh, this this whole situation is quite different. Well, it's, uh, it's, partly it's because it's, especially as we've been led to believe, it's really you know, matters of life and death. Right. Uh, there's a question of who believes that. Right, right, and then, and who, right, who believes what about that? Right. So, so there, you know, we sort of touched on the issue of who you listen to, mm -hmm. and um, you know, there, you know, there is a lot of noise now about the Haredi community, yeah. and you know, our students and they're, they're, most of their clients are in the Haredi community, mm -hmm. and I think you know, we want to try to understand that the issue of who you listen to is very different in the Haredi community than yeah. it is in the non-Haredi community. Mm -hmm. well, that, that, for, that, that for sure. Right. Yeah. Now my, um, Uh, my impression is that for people coming to who are training in the institute now, for many of them, this whole crisis is very, uh, let's say, confusing and upsetting. Dafka uh, in their and how they relate to the bigger Haredi community. Oh, uh, uh, but the, in other words, the Anglo Haredi community is right. a little different than the Bnei Brak and Mea Sharim right. Right. Haredi community. Right, right. Um, so um, as a result, we're talking, as we've spoken sometimes in our supervisory meetings about the Haredi communities. Yes. Uh, uh, each community um, has you see, you know, for, for people who are not in the Haredi community, often you don't know who to ask. You don't know who to believe. So you're left with the media, which you're certainly a skeptical about because things show up that, oops, where was that last yesterday? Um, but uh, it, it's not clear. Whereas each Haredi community in principle, part of the idea of a Haredi community is that there's a sense of who you listen to, but everyone listens to somebody different. Right. So uh, it's not as if, you know, um, everybody knows who to listen to, but there is some guiding uh, spirit that's other than necessarily the community, the, the government in some of those communities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that it's important to recognize and see, I, the way I would put it is this way. Um, it's the government's responsibility to have people believe them. And that's a deep responsibility. And it's something that if we think about differentiation, you got to build it on both sides. You can't just say, I'm the government, you got to listen to me. That's like, you know, being a parent of a two, one year old, or two and a two year old. The government's also adults to adults. And so you have to build a sense of, uh, of uh, um, trust that you can believe what we say. And that's been neglected for uh, God knows how long. And especially in the Haredi community, I think it's been neglected. In other words, there hasn't been an effort to create, let's try to believe each other. The sense is more like, let's, let's divide the cash and turn our backs to each other and live our own lives. And uh, um, that's, that's come home to roost. 
and you know it's a uh, um, it's it's a deep sense of pain I think for me at least it's a deep sense of pain to see it being blamed on these you know low lives who don't know how to listen to the government <clears throat> because I don't think that's fair you know it's a all communication is two sided and this way it's becoming more one sided instead of saying wait a minute how have we created a situation where people don't listen. Actually, while you were talking, I was thinking at this from a different direction, and that is what it's going to be like for our, the people in the program, we're going to be working with Haredi families after this, or even during, but certainly after, after this is sort of passed, and sort of finding their own sort of solid ground to stand on when they have to start a, a sort of exploring with the Karate families what, what went on for them. Right. Yeah. Right. And there may be crises of, um, of uh, um, solidarity there. In other words, it's possible that people may feel, well, we were told to just, you know, take it easy, but we ended up getting all sick. Right, and right. so and so with these losses and, you know, people in the hospital, and all these things. And so um, now what? Yeah. And, and, and here, this actually, it also, it again brings me back to the, um, yeah, to the Intifada. Um, uh, uh, because I remember um, like during the Intifada, I was working for a while with, um, with the, uh, the welfare office in Bet El. Well, and they, they, and they were, you know, they were in charge of helping all these families who were, you know, getting through this, uh, this terrible period. And uh, it took a while before we really realized that, well, wait a second, we're all going through the same thing that these families are going through. And I think this is also, this is going to be a real challenge for the people, well, for all of us, actually. But I think maybe even more so in the Haredi community because you know, my concern is that the Haredi community is going to be more affected by this than, than the general community. And so that, so that people will, will have to think about how are we going to relate to families who, let's say, have internal recriminations about how they, how they acted during the, the, this crisis when we've all had to face those same questions ourselves and uh, right. come up with the whatever, whatever direction we came from. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if we were um, advising or supervising people who are treating mm -hmm. families with adult children yeah. um, and uh, we were thinking about the decisions and how they're made, and the impact of the decisions and how they're made on communication about decisions and how they're made. Um, so we have a very complex uh, issue thinking forward. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, do. Because, because, all, <laughs> because all of those therapists that we're talking about, they are also parts of families of adult children. Right. <laughs> Right. In other words, they're dealing, if they're not dealing with it for themselves, it's going to be hard for them to be helpful. That's right. Right. So in supervision, actually, then this is something I hadn't thought about, but in supervision, we might be talking with our supervisees about in their own families, yeah. how, how much the communication is, um, um, is, is open. In other words, if you say to a, uh, a therapist who's the adult, child, you say, you know, when you make your decisions, um, do you think about the impact that your decision has on your parents, let's say, mm -hmm. and are you helping them to understand how you make your decision? Is the role to tell you your decision is right or wrong, which is not a very useful role, mm -hmm. uh, because then somebody's got to pretend to have a uh, prophecy, or are you finding a way to communicate how I'm making the decision, how you're thinking about how I'm making the decision, how I feel about how you feel about how I feel, you know, the usual kind of striddle of a <laughs> subjective uh, communication. Is it something that's possible now? 
And uh, uh, if it's not, what do we lose by it not being possible? Is it possible now? And, and what is it going to be like when we're, as you say, a little past this? Right. Will we all, will we all have our own, uh, our own memories of what, how we went through this and how we went through this with our families uh, and our parents and, uh, and sort of how can we process that enough so that we will be able to really be therapists for our other families. And so we won't find ourselves sort of processing our own dynamic through the, the families that we're working with. Right, right. And then we'd have to ask ourselves as supervisors when we're talking <laughs> with people from the next generation, yeah. what we're processing. Yeah. Right. This sounds to me like something that it would be, it could be very helpful, let's say in September, to have a kind of seminar for everyone. Oh, for all the generations. For all the, all the generations of the Family Institute. Mm -hmm. Go on, let's, let's hear your fantasy. Yeah. In, like what, what, I'm, what I'm sort of hoping is that by September, uh, we'll all be able to come out of our homes. Right. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that's gonna happen, but let's say as it does, we'll be optimistic. Right. We'll have all gone through this. Uh, and we will be starting out a new year with helping people who also have all gone through this. And we will have had, among the other things, we will have been having supervision of some kind through, through all of this. Right. And I, I would, uh, I'm just thinking, I didn't, I, this idea just came to me that right. it might be because this is going to be a very extraordinary year, we've all gone through, we'll have all gone through an extraordinary experience that would be a good way to start you by trying to talk about it all together. Uh -huh. and but the, the experiences in our own families and the experience our own families and what what is it what has it been like to talk to our clients about this and uh, as a way to sort of get ourselves ready for the new year. Uh -huh. Getting ourselves ready to think about a, a conversation between adults. Right, right, about this. Right. And since, and since, we, um, since we are, we do have sort of two, two generations, roughly. Right. Uh, the Institute, I think that it might be good to try to do that all together. A very interesting idea. So um, consider that done. If it's, okay. uh, if, it, if indeed uh, um, we're gonna be back in business in September, which I hope we will be, and uh, able to sit in the same room mm -hmm. and then women separate. Yeah, you're right, right. It'll be, look at, I think that, I, I, I have some, uh, actually, <clears throat> I have some friends who, uh, who came back to Italy, came back from Italy just when people had to start going into isolation after that. Right. I have no reason why they went, but um, that's another story. Uh, and I know, and they were in, like, in, they were in uh, Bidud for two weeks. And what I found very interesting is that when that Bidud was over, they were not rushing to leave it. There was something very safe about being in Bidud. Right. And I, I, have a, I have a sense that that's going to be, it, it's going to be, for certain people, they are going to have a hard time giving up on the isolation. Mm -hmm. Because when they, sort of the same thing, like people when they, when they have to leave the hospital. They uh -huh. don't want to leave, but there's nothing like having doctors and nurses right there in the case you need them. Right. And here, if you've been away from that virus so long, Mm -hmm. You know, even if they tell you it's not there anymore, 
it's going to be a little hard to <laughs> to really believe that it's not there. Anymore. Right. See, you know, that raises this uh, question in families about the pseudo solutions. In other words, mm -hmm. that the uh, bidud, uh, that's what we were talking about before, it can be a triangle. And so we don't, there are things we don't talk about. We just do things, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about them. We don't have to talk about them. But when we try to come out, then, then, then we'll then be able to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what is, uh, you know, we were thinking about in the clinic that um, probably we're not going to have an awful lot of new cases uh, in the clientele that we have in the clinic until these, his gear, the, the lockdown is over sure. because uh, we're not, it's not so much of a, uh, a virtual computer savvy clientele, mm -hmm. but also that it's hard to start therapy without right. physical presence. But on the other hand, as soon as the lockdown is over, it's probably going to be a rush of new cases. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what we're thinking about is, you know, here is um, the young, <clears throat> younger people would be saying, do I feel like I was an adult? Did anybody help me to feel like an adult? Did anybody help me to say, what does an adult do? And they say, how does an adult reach decisions? What level of... Uh, um, intersubjectivity is involved it's decisions about relationships what level of uh, uh, differentiation was lost because i had to pretend to be an adult and i really didn't have a clue and i couldn't say that i didn't have a clue because you know my parents were saying if you don't have a clue then come and I said, well, i can't come but it's corona it's not about you know and so forth so uh, the likelihood is that if we think about families that there's going to be an impact not necessarily a positive impact on a lot of families of uh, this uh, this pseudo solution, which is kind of a regulation. And then how to talk about it afterwards when it's over is going to be, you know, like, why didn't we feel like coming out and be doing what, you know, mm -hmm. I took a break from you and frankly, you know, and so forth. Yeah. Look, I think that, I think one of the reasons that we may have a rush of families uh, coming in after that is that I think for a large number of people uh, we're going to have a situation that nobody's going to want to talk about it at all that they're they just want it just want it to be over right that's just sort of like that's the opposite of what I was saying before they're the ones who won't want to leave and then the right. ones who want to be past it and then not look back for you know for a minute and then things might creep up that uh, it would just be helpful if we had, if they had some, you know, they had some space to talk about it. Right. See, this question about um, helping people to become adults, you know, uh, um, there's, um, there's this way of thinking about some adolescents who freak out at the beginning of adolescence mm -hmm. and then freeze becoming an adult and they become a pseudo adult or a broken adult, but not a full adult. But, uh, you know, adolescents, you have a long time to develop into becoming an adult. And sometimes the, uh, in the families where people marry early and have children early, they're adults, sort of. In other words, that the, there are some functions of adults that they're doing, but in the, some of the Haredi communities, they're not really expected to be fully adult. Because uh, the extended family and the grandparents has lots of stuff that's uh, helping them through it, so they're not really expected to be what, uh, in let's say the Western civilization, the idea of an adult is sort of like, sort of like you know a Corona person, you know he's <laughs> cut off, he's independent, you know he doesn't need anything. It's sort of a fantasy, but that's how you know that's the idea. Of, first you get that, and then you you know become productive. But in the Haredi communities, the young parents. I'm not really expected to be what the uh, a full functioning independent. The word independent is not a particularly favorable one. No, it's right. It's, it's not. It certainly does not have the same value that, uh, that right. in other parts of Western civilization. That's for sure. Right, but as a result, what is expected of the young adult as an adult may be quite different than what might be expected from a young adult in in, in another cultural setting. No, it, it, I really, I haven't thought about this at all. The, um, 
that sort of the young adults that may have been cut off from their from their you know from their parents would find themselves like feeling unequipped to to really right. to really deal with things. Right. Learn what it, what it really means to be an adult. Right. For example, you know, if if you're in a culture where you're married and have a few kids, but you're still being helped to be an adult. That's considered mm -hmm. culturally acceptable. That you, nobody thinks that you know everything, you know, about life. Mm -hmm. That you know, you're still being helped to be an adult. So the Corona crisis um, will will put a spotlight on that. You know, in other words, what are you really being expected? And particularly in a Haredi family, which is not necessarily involved so much with the internet and uh, with the virtual connection. So suddenly you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You don't have the kind of uh, resources. And even if you think you can use the internet, but your parents don't want to. So you're on your own. And so suddenly you're, uh, um, uh, you're in a expectation which wasn't plan A. And you know, who's gonna be helping you become an adult? you know, when you don't really feel like an adult and the people who do help you informally, it was never formally said that's what they're still doing. And boop, they're off the screen. And so... Yeah. And, then, and actually that's what we would, could connect to what we talked about in the beginning about how the decisions are made and how to deal with this. Right. Now, whether you really, were you, like who's, whose rules are you going to abide by? And if right. you're feeling less equipped to really be an, a, an independent adult, that could certainly influence your decision in, in who to believe. Right, right. And then if we look, it is a population that we service of people who, in the process of becoming young adults, become Haredi. Mm -hmm. That's not how they were. There's a whole population of people there. And... Uh, they were brought up with the Western kind of expectation. Mm -hmm. and then they live in a different kind of a culture, um, but um, they're left pretty much on, on their own during this crisis. Who's going to help them to become more adult? You know, they expect themselves to already be adults, so you know that's not part of Haredi culture. But it's part of with what they left and didn't leave. So there's going to be some. Uh, um, some some real difficulties in be, becoming adults when they don't quite feel it. Right. Well, um, we've raised uh, um, a number of issues that I hadn't thought we were going to get to. Right. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I think I just want to go back to the one that you raised, which is a complete surprise to me, which is um, um, our supervisees, because that's who we're talking to here. Yeah. And we're sort of saying to them, um, since you're mental health professionals, so you sort of ask to more mentalize about your world than the average person does. That's, that's the price of being a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. You start to think about everything because if you don't think about it for yourself, how are you gonna help your clients through? And if you do think about it for yourself, so you become some sort of a twisted monster. It's hard to live with you, but uh, um, you know you gotta work that out because, uh, um, so you're, you're sort of suggesting to our supervisees that they think to themselves about um, themselves as adults, in what way um, do they, um, can they make the dealing with this corona business uh, make them feel more adult? Well, uh, but both, both looking and seeing, sort of examining how, how they've been like finding their way through this up to now and, and think of it as, as an opportunity to, to, um, so to continue their growth, yeah, I think I think that's right. So in other words, we'd be sort of uh, saying to them, see, we we never really say this uh, to adolescents, although we sometimes do in, in adolescents in family therapy. Mm -hmm. You say to an adolescent, well, you got to bring up your parents, you know, 
they were always two years behind. That's how it is with parents. And so you got to bring them up to date, you know, and uh, give them the kicks that, you know, adolescents give them. And uh, um, when you feel that your parents are changing, then you know you're in movement, right? In other words, you say, look, it may have been mild or it may have been not so mild, but after the struggle, your parent says, ah, I guess you're 17 and not 13. I, so, so then I become a different parent. So, you know, we say with adolescents that the family is co-creating itself, that, you know, you don't expect an adolescent just to live with the people treating him like the same. So who's going to get them to be this different? You're going to get them. And then, so you see that you're, the family is an adolescent. So in some ways we're looking at a family with um, adult children as also in some sort of a transition. In other words, that we're asking for, uh, in looking at how the corona crisis is dealt with, that there be a change. In other words, that you and I and all us old folks would ask ourselves, have we changed? In other words, have we moved? In some ways, are we seeing our adult children as more adult? Are we engaging in them in a conversation that helps them to be more adult? But I have to, you know, add in the zinger, does that make us less adult? <laughs> Do we lose something for that? Do we gain no, something? No, that makes it, that makes us more adult. Go on. Um, if we, the more that we can see our adult children as adults, it means that we have going through a, a process of differentiation ourselves. Right. And that we are not, it doesn't mean that we need to forget what they were like when they were younger, or we can, whatever we happen to feel about that, whether we cherish it or whatever we feel, but we need to recognize that they are adults. And if we can do that, actually, we have grown as as people. Right. In other words, we've ro grown into a role which helps them in their role. Right. Which is what we're supposed to be doing as parents. But their <laughs> role happens to be to replace us in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not yeah. fun and games. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that they can't uh, ask for some of our wisdom as well, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> But as long as it means that we're sharing wisdom as adult to adult, yes. as an adult with more experience to an adult who's curious about it, but not as an adult to a child where uh, there's a different level of, uh, of maturity. We're at the same level of maturity, different levels of experience, right? But that, that's not a done deal until you do it. In other words, that's, what, that's what we're working on. So in some ways we'd be asking our supervisees be giving us a little kick also, which is actually part of supervision. That at some point you say, okay, you're cooked. Yeah. <laughs> You've, uh, that's, that's the pleasure of being a supervisor. So, you know, you actually are now ready to work independently. And so supervision becomes a little different. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes people stay in supervision. You have experience with people who stay in supervision a long time, yeah. but it morphs over time. Right, right. It, it changes over time. Right, right. right. For sure it changes over time. Right. And in some ways, that kind of change, that's the kind of change we're talking about with adult children. Mm -hmm. That the, um, the pleasure is to see you becoming, um, you know, the, the famous statement of Nietzsche, if you want to become like me, be like yourself. <laughs> right? Because uh, you can't, that, the idea isn't to be my groupie or my child forever. The idea is to become an adult who has moved me along also, because I can't do that by myself. It's not a, it's the same way when you're dealing with your first 16 year old, you don't know how to do it. You've never done it before. So your 16 year old gives you a kick and they say, oh, now I think I know what to do. Um, so we need to get kicked also in some ways to, uh, and maybe that'll be part of the symposium in September yeah. that you propose that we get the right kind of kick about are we doing the right thing in helping people become adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I look forward to the conditions which will allow us to
think about this in a few months. <laughs> right. Do you think we're doing the wrong thing to think about it now? Um, uh, I think uh, I think we need to um, let's see. I I really was thinking it more in terms of like having gone through this. Uh, you're bringing up the idea. Well, maybe we need to do it while we're going through it, which is right. us, which is uh -huh. a different. It's a different angle, you know. It's a different angle. For, for our students, we could remind them that in some ways um, um, it's part of the interesting issue of mentalization of a therapist. In other words, a, th a therapist or a supervisor with a supervisee thinks about not just what it is, but what it could be. You know, if you say it is what it is, there's no conversation. So when you mentalize, you think of what it could be. But that doesn't mean that that's how it is yet. Right. You know, was, you're always thinking in some ways about how it might be. The same way that when you think for a client, you say, how could this person be a, a better version of himself? What would be help him to be himself and to be, because he comes in saying, this is terrible. So if we say, well, it is what it is, it's just terrible. You know? So then how is that going to help? So we in some ways have to think further ahead, but remember that it's just thinking further ahead. It's imagination. It's not a done deal. There's still work to do. Or it's, or it's, it's even experiencing a bit differently. Go on. But that's, but that's what it is. It's, it's a, it's a new experience that I, what, what was I thinking about when you were talking? I was thinking about, this is especially, especially I think with couples, but also in therapy in general, like something will happen in therapy a change will happen in therapy, but then it won't happen at home. It right. only happens, like it happens here. You know? And uh, people can sometimes get very disappointed because of that. Right. But, uh, but really, but I was thinking of that in those terms of you're sort of mentalizing a different experience that uh, you find to find the way to make, you know, to help that experience grow outside as well. Right, right. In 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 the the class, we talk about Vygotsky that way. You know that uh, um, there are things that happen together with someone else because mm -hmm. it gets you. But you're participating in something. It's not yet yours. So you you know if you're in a class and it's interesting, so that's terrific. You go home and say, I don't know what that was about. I don't remember anything. Right. <laughs> and so that you, you could say that was a failure or that was a success, come back, we'll work on it some more, you're halfway there, you're a quarter of the way there, but you're on the way. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, what we, what we may be wanting to be doing is to think past the experience yet as a way to pull towards the experience, but it doesn't replace the experience, it still has to be lived through. In other words, we would be telling our supervisees, uh, think about something that you might be able to say differently to your adult parent about your being an adult and how you make decisions, but don't expect it to be done. You know, that's, you know, something that, and you don't have to do it now if everybody's plussing about the next regulation or the next death or God knows what. You don't have to do it now, but be able to think ahead is uh, part of what we do that makes life bearable because we don't see it as, as, uh, as stuck. We see it as something that it's not done to us, it's something that we're part of creating. And the part that we create are the meanings and the possibilities and so forth. But then you got to live through it with the people that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. So there, there's the rub, as they say. Yes. What's that? That's the rub. <laughs> you have to that, that, that's it. the rub, or, or that's the uh, that's the richness of it all. Right. Uh, yeah. You have to live through it. So you've given us an idea of what we're going to try to start to live through in September. Okay. And, uh, um, uh, do you have some more thoughts before we uh, finish up? Um, I think um, the only thing is I'm really left with is the thoughts in the direction of what is really going through, what's really happening, I think, in, in the families in the Haredi community. Right. And um, uh, 
I mean, when you were talking about the um, the young adults who are not used to being adults yet, who are not, who don't feel themselves so much as adults, and who maybe even didn't have that much of an expectation to be more of an adult. Um, I'm thinking, are any of them really faced with a kind of crunch that was just unexpected for them, in, in, in the sense of a, within their within their community, within their family, within the uh, you know the shiva world that they're living in, and, and how are they how are they going through that now, uh -huh. and what are the going what are the implications of that going to be, let's say in the years to come. For them, right? Because we really are, we are going through a a clearly a an historical. It, people are going to the people are going to learn about the Corona crisis. Right. They learn history. Let's let's say the world we're still learning history in the next uh, you know, <laughs> future. Right. That's optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and. In, I'm thinking about like people who went through the depression, people who went through World War II, people who went through Vietnam. Like it's going to, it's going to impact. And I'm thinking about what the impact is really going to be in the Haredi community as well. Uh -huh. Very interesting. We'll start to hear. So yeah. we have some open questions. Yeah. Okay. okay, David, thank nice you very much. You. It's nice talking to you. This is uh, an example of what old people do when they are locked up. They talk right. to each other. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm going to turn okay, off the recording. Thank you. Okay, bye bye.